My name's Sasha Pete. I'm joined by a fantastic individual. This man was a pioneer playing a number of European clubs, none other than the great Socceroo, David Mitchell. Welcome, David. Thank you, Sash. Thanks for the interview. So uh, tell us, David, how did you fall in love with our great game? Oh, obviously, <clears throat> coming from my background, just a Scottish background, growing up in uh, Glasgow, I was uh, six years old when I immigrated to Australia. So when we came out here, uh, the first football I played was actually AFL because that was, that was the only sport that they played at the time. It was a new area in, in Adelaide. Anyway, I uh, started football. My, my older brothers played football, so I played with them. And then I started playing in Adelaide and then, you know, I fell in love with it because obviously it's your, uh, it's your background. Um, followed Glasgow Rangers, my dad's favourite club at the time and his passion. And he was a semi-professional himself. So I just growing up in the game and loved it and then progressed through some state teams in South Australia and then played for Adelaide City and then obviously got transferred to Sydney, uh, Sydney City or Sydney Core or Sydney Slickers at the time. And, and then I wanted to go overseas because you'd sort of reached the top in Australia um, and transferring from Adelaide to Sydney was a, a Australian transfer record of $35,000 at the time, you know, so um you'd reached the pinnacle. So you wanted to keep going. And I thought I was good enough. And, uh, you know, so lucky enough, I did. So I made a deal with Frank Lloyd to buy my contract. So that at the end of my contract, I could go over to, uh, to Rangers on a trial with um, a possibility of signing as a contract. You know? So, yeah, so that's how I fell in love with the game. I played at a younger level and it was uh, in, your, in your, your family's history. The uh, so you were so in your adult career you're always at the, the top of the, the the pitch. So as a junior, what, did you gravitate to uh, becoming a goal scorer? Is that where your, your well, no, as, as, as a youngster, I played as a centre half, uh, and okay. then a midfielder, and a right winger, and not a right winger, um, a right back. And then because I was very quick, um, you know, they put me up front. So okay. uh, and it was up front as one of the state teams I played up front, and then. I think it was Ron Smith who was running the AIS at the time, but just started the AIS. I think it was their first ever intake. Um, we had a championship playoffs and Ron was coaching Queensland and we beat them. And he said, I was a really good dribbler. Uh, and that, uh, you know, he liked dribblers. And he said, I had a lot of assets and he wanted to take me to the AIS. So unfortunately I was playing in the A-League at that time or the NSL at the time at the highest level. So I thought going to... Uh, a sport when it was going juniors and going to the AIS was a step backwards because I was playing men's football. Mm. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so unfortunately, but, you know, in hindsight, I would have liked to have gone there for at least a year and learned a lot of the trade of uh, what footballers do as a young person. But, um, but I'd sorry, probably progressed past that at the time. So that was so, unfortunate. So, so you, you're in around 18 years old when you, when you first uh, play for Adelaide uh, City. So did you, get, did you make any other uh, – did you play senior football before you were 18 in the NSL for, for another club or was it – was, uh... Well, it was Adelaide. Adelaide. Well, it was Enfield Victoria. So when I went to Enfield Victoria, which is a club, state league club in Adelaide, um, and we got to the final of the Ampol Cup they used to have and, you know, we played uh, – in the final, and Raul Rasik was the Adelaide City manager at the time. And he uh, he saw me and wanted to sign me after seeing me a couple of games. Okay. Well, so from there, that's how it really kick-started, because Raul Rasik saw me and then he signed me from playing State League at Enfield Victoria, and unfortunately, they're not around anymore. Um, but, yeah, then I progressed to Adelaide City, and that's when I you know played the NSL from there. But I, I played in the Australian World Youth Cup that was held in Australia. In 1981, it was the first finals they had in Australia, and um, yeah, we did well. We got to the quarterfinals. So, uh, what were some of the what were some of the teammates in that uh, in that World Youth? So, who were some of your teammates? Do you remember? Oh, some of the um, were Peter Raskopoulos. I don't know if you know Peter Raskopoulos. There was Robbie Wheatley. There was Grant Lee, uh, Glenn O'Hearn. There was Paul Kay. Uh, yeah, there was a, a few players. Uh, Mark Cousas was there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we had uh, quite a good, quite a good squad. Oscar Crino was another one that was in there. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a good uh, Steve Blair, another one. Uh, we had Les Shineplug and Raul Blanco were the, the managers at the time. 
And we played Argentina for the first game and uh, they were the world champions. They just won the World Cup, the last one, the, the World Youth Cup. And our first game, we beat them 2-1. So yeah. that was a fantastic game and uh, one that uh, really set the benchmark for young Australian teams to to play against because there was no fear. So um, we, we won, we progressed, we played England, we drew with them and we played Cameroon, we drew with them. So, And then we played Germany in the quarterfinals where... Uh, you know, we lost 1-0 and we missed a penalty, unfortunately, you know. So uh, uh, we didn't qualify. But um, the Germans went on and won it, obviously, but they knocked us out. So, you know, we would have come close to winning it had we beat, beat Germany. The, uh, and that, that transfer to uh, Sydney City, they were very much the glamour side at the at the time at the NSL. You know, they, 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 would, they would have had like half a dozen or so uh, socceroos in that side. So uh, talk to me about that move uh, to uh, Sydney City, moving from Adelaide, you grew up, you grew up there, you spent your whole time there. Now you're living away from home. Was that a, was that a good um, sort of learning experience for you then to go overseas and then, you know, live by yourself, et cetera? So what was happening at that time? Yeah, well, look, I've been with a Australian youth team, so I've, I travelled a lot. We've travelled all over Asia. We've been to mm. China and Taiwan. and So you're used to travelling with teams. Um. And I know I got to a certain stage with Adelaide. Incidentally, what happened? I went over for a trial at Rangers. Uh, Adelaide mm-hmm. let me go. They said, well, we'll let you go. And then when I was there, um, Rangers asked how much to Adelaide. And they said 100000 you know. And it was oh. like, and, uh, you know, the manager pulled me aside and said, son, look, we could buy a good player here for that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I, so, and I said to him, well, okay, if I come back and I was a free player, chilly, and it didn't cost any money, would you take me in for a trial to have a look at me? And he said, yes, and I would. So that's when I let, when, when Sydney City wanted me, I, I knew that uh, there was a big transfer fee, but I made an agreement with uh, Andrew Ledra um, and uh, Frank Loy that if I come there and we win the league, then I could buy my contract and go over for a trial. So... Yeah, so- uh, R- rumor has a so, so uh, did you mention earlier? So you, you said there was a uh, thirty five grand. So this is like 19- yeah, my my my, uh, my the, the transfer was thirty five grand, and uh, then at the moment I bought my contract a year later for thirty grand. Okay. Uh, so I paid thirty grand back to Sydney FC or uh, Sydney City. Yeah, yeah. So I could go on a trial. And there was no no guarantee. How, you'd get- how, how did you how did you how did you put together that cash? Because you, you could have bought like in, uh, in well look I mean the cost of a house the, at the time. Part of right? the, yeah, part of the transfer fee that I got from uh, Adelaide, I earned some of the transfer fee, uh, and then I was quite a good saver, and we were in camps a lot with the Australian youth team. I was played a couple of games for the national team as well, so you know I'd saved a lot of money at the time, and my goal was to you know. Get free. So um, with that, I saved every, pair, every penny I could, you know, and uh, managed to buy my contract so I could go. Um, so that was um, brilliant. So that, that's, a, that's a that's a that's a huge testament to yourself to in order to believe in yourself that you say you, you know buy the contract to back yourself to go and, and and trial. So when I suppose that first trial that you went there, you you know being able to see the other boys play, and could you mix it like? Let's say yeah. there was zero transfer. At the time, you felt like you could have made that side? Oh, that was it, Sasha. That was exactly... I saw that I was good enough, but you just needed the opportunity. Mm. So it's getting the opportunity. And, you know, coming from Australia, it doesn't happen very often. There wasn't many agents about it at the time. My father knew the assistant manager at Rangers. So that's how he cracked open the invite. So he sent him a letter saying I played for the national team. I played mm. for the youth team. Mm. And that he'd reached the echelon of Australian football and he wants to prove himself overseas. And, you know, my dad said, I think my son's good enough, which a lot of dads do. So, (laughs) but uh, my dad played with this guy. So he took my dad's letter and said, look, all right, we'll have a look at him. So um... he going to have a look. And and the first time I went there was uh, it opened the opportunity for me to see what was available and if I was good enough. And I, I certainly felt I was. So it was uh, spending the money, I think, was a good option because it, it brought me from... And back in those days, when your transfer finished, you were still under contract. The club could still ask for money. There was no... Bosman, yeah. No Bosman yeah. rule at the time. Yeah. So it was... Yeah. Uh, the club still owned you and people couldn't believe that, but uh, it was, that's what happened. Yeah, so, so they... 
clubs saw that transfer fee as an investment, like the poker chip on the table to to keep yeah. uh, playing. Uh, so, yeah, and some of the some of the asks were ridiculous afterwards. So, but, that, but that's the thing. How 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 special? So you, you've lined up for the the national uh, team. You know, you you yeah. grew up in Australia. You know, what, what talk to me about that moment where you first you you first playing a senior game for the national team. What kind of what kind of sense of pride do you do you get? Yeah, well, look, it was like look, because I played for the national youth team, um, and we'd uh, you know played in the World Cup, and you know playing Argentina and playing West Germany. You know, you're playing the elite of the elite in world football, and you're you're matching it with them. You see, so mm-hmm. you could see from that that you were on the right track. But unfortunately, in Australia, you, you reach a certain level, and if you don't improve from that, if you don't get out of it, mm-hmm. then you stay at that level, and you might be the best there for there for five, six, seven years. Mm. But if you don't get out, then you don't improve. So, you know, it was for me to say, like, I knew I was good enough or I thought I was good enough. And it's just creating the opportunity to, to make. So that's why having a transfer fund that I could pay for and go there, I opened the door to give you a chance. Oh. And then having a chance, then when I was going there and, and I could stay there month after month, then the second month they said, look, you know, we like what we see. You know, we're just going to play you in a game next week. And that was a cup game, and I played in that cup game. And then, uh, and then after that, they said, "Oh, look, you know, um, Monday morning, come in, and we'll talk to you. If anyone asks you, just tell them you've signed for us." So, great feeling. But the week after, I mean, I signed on that Monday, and I got my got my thirty thousand dollars back in a in a transfer signing on fee, which was good. But the next game was that next Saturday, and it was against Celtic at Parkhead. What a yeah! What a game to so feature. my first ever game for Rangers in a Premier League game was against Celtic at Parkhead. Yeah, and it's funny because I just I sent Anja a message last week before his game yep. when they played Rangers, and I just wished him good luck. You know, even though I'm a Rangers fan and everything else, uh, some things are bigger, and I want Anja to do well for, for Australian football for the coaching yeah. side because he's doing it as I did back in the day in, in playing. He's doing it now in a coaching level and. And breaking all the molds, and it's like <clears throat> you saw Angie. He, he came and did very well back in Australia when he got the chance again. Mm. Did very well. Went to Japan and did well. And it's just creating that opportunity. And lucky enough, Celtic saw that in him, and and they've they've taken a chance. And you could see he's doing a fantastic job. And I think they'll probably win the league now. And it's getting the opportunity right. And it's like picking the diamonds out of you know, the rough diamonds out of somewhere. And then, you know, like in Africa, there was a lot of players in Africa, but they never, then they go and pick them and, and get them and they can play at that level. It's just need the the dedication and the training and it, it could work, you know. Mm. Talk to me about some of the names in that uh, in that Rangers side that you think are cave jeepers well, are now lining up with. All right. Well, the thing about Rangers, a lot, a lot of, not many people would probably know all the names at the time because it wasn't as big as the Premier League and the Premier League hadn't started there. But, uh, you know, the English League was always bigger. But we had uh, a guy called Davy Cooper, who was a fantastic player. Um, we had uh, Ali McCoist. Oh, quality. Uh, so, Ali, I made his first goal and he made my first goal. So, that's, um, you know, Ali and I are quite close as well. So, he's a good guy. Yeah, um, many caps for Scotland as well. Ali uh, played, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, yeah. he's got many, many caps. I don't know how many, but he's got plenty, yeah. you know. And um, we had um, John McClelland, who was um, a Northern Irish international. Who was uh, mm-hmm. who else? Bobby Russell was another great player. But these these probably aren't big names, but a lot of Scottish people in that time would know them. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Rangers were a, a big club and had a lot of good players. Yeah, brilliant. So. Um... It, it's interesting. So uh, you, you go on to to play in uh, in uh, Hong Kong. Um, in the, is it the for, for Seiko? Is it uh, yeah? You you uh, how was that experience? Well, what happened there was that uh, when I left Rangers, I because the managers changed. John, John Greg signed me. John Wallace came in, and then I had a year with John John Wallace. And then I, I went to Rangers and said I wanted to leave. So I wanted to go and play in Europe. Okay. Because I felt growing up in Australia, playing uh, with Adelaide City, um, it was like a culture of uh, smorgasbord of food and also in football. You know, the way the Italians played, 
at the time, the Italian league was probably the best in the world. You know, the way they they uh, they had all the best players and the, the Italian league was great. And that was always one of my goals to play in Italy. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so Adelaide City was a was a great club, and I learned a lot from them. And going to Hong Kong was a scenario where if uh, I would come back to Australia within three years, I became a Sydney City player again. So I had three months, three months where, or two, I think it was two months, I had to go somewhere and play. Um, to avoid that clause. To avoid that clause kicking in or whatever, you know. So yeah, okay. it was a scenario. So, all right, people think it's a strange one, Hong Kong, but it was like the only place to go and, and you were, you know, you, you could get a deal like that. And look, Hong Kong was fantastic. I mean, it was like... Big money, big money being thrown around in the Hong Kong league. Well, yeah. put it this way, I was getting paid more in Hong Kong than I was at Rangers. Yeah, I believe it. I believe oh. it. And, so, and our, our coach was the, uh, he was a Dutch international coach. He, he coached the national team. And also one of the players was a guy called Renny van der Kerkhoff who'd played in two World Cups. Yes. You know, yes. so like they, they were a good side and we won the cup and we won the league and it was a fantastic time there for three months I was there. So you, and then they took me to North Korea there as well. So that was like that oh, was okay. unbelievable. So that would have been an ex, uh, extraordinary experience, you know, North Korea being closed off. So what yeah, nineteen eighty five. Oh, it was like unbelievable. It's like yeah, it's uh, <laughs> now. Yeah. Now when you go, you get chaperoned. Basically, yeah. you can't. You can't. Work. Was the team chaperoned when you when you? Yeah, played? we were then. We were then too. Um, you know, we yeah. stayed in a hotel, and you know, every morning at six o'clock, they had the military parade marching down the road. So it was like, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. And uh, it's funny. It, um, anyway, yeah, the food wasn't too good either. <laughs> <laughs> the um, so you also did stints in the in the German first division uh, with uh, Eintracht in, in Frankfurt. Um, Explain to me what what uh, what what led you to Germany. Well, okay, I uh, well after the Hong Kong, I came back to Australia and I focused on the World Cup qualification for, for okay. four or five months. Yeah, um, and that's when we played Israel and we played okay. New Zealand and then we played Scotland. So that was a that was a, a four or five month period where I focused on that because I wanted to get to the World Cup. Yeah, um, and obviously we fell short playing against Scotland, but. Um, the, the German manager at the time um, of uh, the German national youth team which we played against in the World Youth Cup here remembered me from playing for Australia mm-hmm. and then he knew me I was playing at Glasgow Rangers and then he became the manager of Eintracht Frankfurt okay. and they wanted a striker. So I was uh, a good option, he thought, and they, they inquired and then found out that I was available and then uh, a deal was made, you know, so it was fantastic. And going to Germany was like walking into the future. They were so advanced about how they looked after players and their training and everything else was fantastic. You know, it's like really, I I was a different level. So one of, one of the things I remember probably best that your game is you always sort of knew that your anticipation was that next level. I think so you, you were pretty quick. You could dribble, but it was that idea of knowing that, that sense of it, where to be in the that that um, in that goal mouth. So, how how do you develop that as a player? Is that intrinsic or is that coached? So, walk me through. What are you trying now? You're you're, you're progressing as a player. How do you work that out on uh, knowing where to be or anticipating oh, where the ball? A bit to of be? both, really. I mean, sometimes a bit of instinct, but uh, uh, there are. You've, <laughs> There are certain things where I wish I would have been taught when I was young earlier, a lot mm-hmm. earlier that I would have been taught that uh, would have made you even a better goal scorer. Because um, I was not a bad goal scorer, but I wasn't prolific, but I made goals for other people. So I was mm-hmm. uh, quite an unselfish player and I played for the team more or less, you know. Mm-hmm. But but in essence, yeah, there's certain things where, yeah, you have players that can read the instincts so, or, um, you know, and it's just switching off. And I always say, even in practice drills now or practice sessions where we're doing from finishing, uh, if we're doing a double combination, if my partner's shooting, I've got to follow up. And if I don't follow up, then uh, then you do 10 push-ups, you know, and they soon get the, <laughs> they get the motion where, oh, I better keep following in. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be like Schwarzenegger, you know, you're going to be built. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a great one. That's so the thing is with that is it's anticipation. So am I having a shot? When everyone, when people shoot, they actually watch, stand still, and they don't do anything. Mm-hmm. But it's actually to see them having a shot and then following up because they get, keep it might spill it 
or it might yeah. hit the post. And that there, that's a bit of anticipation, but that you, you can learn that, right? So you get taught that. And then there's movement within the box about losing an opponent within the box about, we call them putting on the false foot. You know, you sort of, you, you, you run one way to run there and then you come back and you, uh, you create space for yourself within the box, but that's just being taught. And then it's your body angle about receiving the ball when the ball comes in from across, rather than attack it side on, you check it at a 45 degree angle because it's a much better way to approach the ball. Mm, brilliant advice. So, the um, so you you were never shy about moving from club to club. If there was a better opportunity or a different opportunity, um, you you were you felt comfortable moving out of your comfort zone. Um, when well, you, as, when as my dad said, they found out I was rubbish the first or second year. Then they kicked me out and moved me on. You see. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, it. yeah, so the, uh, so, you know, throughout, throughout your career, I mean, we'll, we'll just uh, call out some of the, the clubs that you played at. So, um, so for after, after you spent some time at, at final, you, you were at Chelsea, you mentioned that you were at Millwall before, um, you, you, uh, you did a stint at Newcastle, I think. And, um, you know, these are these are all big clubs in their own right, right? So when you when you look back at your your, your time playing in Europe, do you think okay, my, my heart and mind sort of gravitates to this period at, at this club? Do you, do you feel that do you have an affinity to to one club over another? Yeah, well, each club you have a special time with, you know. I mean, look, uh, one of the clubs is Millwall was a great little club, you know. It's like. Mm. Uh, and when I say a little, they're, they're, they're a good-sized club. But, uh, you know, I've played at some bigger clubs, you know, with final winning the European Cup and Rangers and, mm. and Chelsea. But uh, my time at Chelsea wasn't good because I was injured. Mm. And that goes on. I couldn't. I had a recurring injury, and it, uh, then you lost your confidence. And it just – that was a bad period of my life. But mm. um, going to Germany was super good. I got married there to my beautiful wife, and, okay. and I'm still married to today. And, um, you know, she's from a Croatian-Italian background. Yeah. Um, so I punched my butt my weight there. So good, good for you. And and you know, then when we went to Holland, we had our first daughter, was born in Holland. So it was a special time there, you know, at that, that time and that era. And then you went to the Olympics for Australia, you know, and then moving to Chelsea, uh, I had a lot of problems and things didn't go well there. But yeah, the next move I went to Millwall, and then from there I went to Swindon. Well, I went to Swindon first, and Glenn Hoddle was the manager there. And I probably wouldn't have gone to a club like Swindon, mm-hmm. but um Glenn Hoddle was the manager and Glenn asked me to come and play for him because he saw me play and we played together because he was at Chelsea at the time and he was injured too. So mm-hmm. we played in the reserves together a little bit and we struck up a good combination. So when he took the Swindon gig, I thought, yeah, I'll go there because I wasn't sure if I'd recover from my injury or not. Uh, in the second division at that point in time. So where, where, where were they? Where was Swindon? Uh, they were in the championship. Yeah. The second division. Yeah. Well, yep. the second division. Yeah. Yeah. So, and with Glenn, we, we we played at the Wembley final and got to the Wembley and got to Premier League with uh, with Swindon, you know. So that, was like, that would have been a special time, right? winning a flag with anybody. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. No, no, that yeah. was um, oh, there were seventy three thousand at Wembley. You know what I mean? And wow, that was a that was a full stadium at the time. That was the capacity. I think seventy four was it, and seventy three yeah. played Leicester in the final, and yeah, we won four three. So that was uh, fantastic. Uh, if you ever look yeah, on brilliant. YouTube, that's one of the best games. Yeah, brilliant. Um, brilliant. Yeah, and we got to yeah, we got to the final and we won it and yeah, we travelled to uh, travelled up to the Premier League, which is great. Yeah, so the uh, they they say uh, Millwall's probably one of the most passionate fans uh, in the UK. Yeah. So they they they're quite a. So what 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 was the what was their affinity to the players? Was there any connection between the supporter base and, and being? Yeah, well, look, I was fondly uh, liked at Millwall. A lot of people at Millwall um, remember remember my time there. And um, in fact, I think it was uh, they had uh, a lot of past um, supporters vote the best Millwall eleven, and uh, I think I got in about ten. Or was it nine times out of about twelve picked? Um, you know, and you're talking about some big names they had there as well, Terry mm. Sheringham and all that there, you know, so I ended mm. up being in, in the team regularly um, mm. from that supporters being picked. But, yeah, Millwall's a passionate club. Yeah, for sure. They love their club. And, you know, they, they did have a bad reputation and, you know, they, they still have that with um, certain things. But, uh, you know, the people are good, they're passionate and they, they, they just feel they uh, no one likes them and they're, 
they had done by, you know, so mm. a little mm. bit. But uh, but yeah, but it's a tough area, and um, that's what you get, you know, from from tough areas. You get a lot of passionate fans that want to want to win, you know, and mm. it's a great mm. little club. So you were you were um, uh, playing in Europe at a time where, by playing for the national team, there were some sacrifices in terms of you know not. How, how did you uh, resolve those issues? Because there, there were other other players that made decisions at particular points in time not to make that sacrifice. Talk to me about that, where you know you might have had a manager who says, "Listen, if you if you leave now, you might be out of my selection, etc." Or... Oh, that yeah, that so that happened at final. Even though I had it in my contract, I could go. So I made sure I put that in because there was no fever dates then. Back in those days, there was no FIFA dates where you could go and play and the clubs don't play. So um, I had it in my contract that when Australian national team uh, called me up, uh, it was, um, you know, I could go and it was in the contract. But it had to be a big enough game, obviously, because I think, um, you know, coming back, I think we played New Zealand and, and Israel and these games I came back for. But, mm. you know, we're playing Tahiti and Fiji and that, then it wasn't yeah. worth coming back for. And I remember for the Olympics, going to the Olympics, which was in September, and you're away for like five weeks. You know, I just started the uh, uh, European uh, League. It just started in uh, August. Our first game was against uh, PSV Eindhoven, who were the European champions at the time. They were European champions, uh, PSV Eindhoven. And we played them at first game of the season, bang, bang, within five minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes, sorry, I'd scored two goals. Mm -hmm. Then I hit the crossbar and we drew 2 2 with them, you know. And Gus Hiddick was their manager. And they had a fantastic team, you know. And also that Holland had also won the European Championships as well. So you had PSV Eindhoven won the European Cup. Um, and then you had also the uh, the Dutch winning the European Championships. So it was a flavor of their month and it was like fantastic. And then a couple of games in from there, I scored a couple of more goals. And then the manager said to me, I don't want you to go to. Uh, to the Olympics. Okay. So I said, well, I have to go. I've, I've committed to going. And if I didn't go, then they would have had a spot that uh, couldn't be filled by someone else. Um, and I wanted to represent Australia in the Olympics. You know. Mm. Um, so sure enough, I went there when I came back because I'd been away for four weeks. Then they put me back on the bench when I came back. Um, and then I played the next game. But then he was he was um, wanting to help him get his other guy. He brought another guy in who was a Dutch guy from... Portugal, and uh, he brought him in, and and then it was a, a contest between me and him, really. And then I knew that they wanted to move me out, so I went to talk to Aberdeen, then I went to talk to Chelsea, and I thought, right, okay, well, if this isn't going to work out, if I should have stuck out really, but in hindsight, but yeah, I didn't. So I, I ended up saying, well, if I move, I'll move. So I moved, and then uh, that's when I went to Chelsea. But you know, I, the, 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 so this tension, this tension about um, you know losing your spot. Right, and playing for the national team because you, you played for you know less than petrol money, right? So playing for the national team, uh, yeah. it's very much for the honour, isn't it? Right, and it was it was economy seats as well, you know, flying yeah. there international. You know, it wasn't a business class that you get these days. So yeah, yeah. Um, so who talk to me about some of the the experiences uh, playing for the national team? Firstly, who did you room with? Who who did you room with the majority of the time? Well, there's a couple of people. There was a guy called. Uh, uh, Jennings, do you know? Yeah, yeah, Flash yeah. Jennings, absolutely. Yeah, that's right, Flash. So I played with well, we were him, and we played a lot of chess actually. You know, because you okay, you uh, you travelled a lot, and um, you know, board games were the things they weren't computers these days. You know, mm -hmm. um, so he was my main uh, my main one, and uh, there was um, Kenny Murphy was another one. Yeah, yep, yeah, Ken, yeah no. was another one. Chili was another one. Um, yeah, and the younger age group was another boy called Ian McKay, who's from Adelaide, who you probably won't know, but he sort of played NSL and uh, didn't play for the national team. But, yeah, uh, room with him for a little bit as well. So and oh, I think Steve played for a little bit as well. So Okay, so you, you, you sort of uh, – so you got uh, – with Kenny Murphy, you got that Scottish uh, connection going, right? So was were they tidy rooms or were they messy rooms? Talk to me about – Oh, no, he was always tidy. I was messy, he said. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, he right, says, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So um, the uh, the uh, when, when you when you think back, well, the 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 the, the ideas. W w 
you, you think back of the big games that you played in and you think, okay, I wish I could relive that moment. Any particular games that you think, oh, you know, if I could only get put on the boots again and roll out to that stadium, walk me through a moment. Yeah, well, one, that, uh, the, the, the first one when we played at Celtic at Parkhead where I got man of the match in that game, so I played really well. Yeah. Um, you know, and some YouTube clips come up and you can see it. Some people send it to you and you go, all right, okay. And Mitch, is this you? You know, and you can see yourself dribbling and doing well. And yeah, that was fantastic. You know, and then the PSV Eindhoven, I said, and then, yeah. you know, against Scotland. Uh, and I don't have, I haven't gone back. And the Wembley game, I haven't looked at either, you know. I've never watched the Wembley final, but... Um, Okay. I, I, I don't tend to go back and watch games, you know, so, but people send you clips of, you know, I mean, scoring goals against Inter Milan and Porto, FC yeah. Porto for Rangers in the European Cup, you know, and scoring against Real Madrid and Aberdeen and that when I played for um, Feyenoord in the Cup. So, um, yeah, so, so many, many good times, you know, two goals at Stuttgart when we played them and, you know, um, they had the famous German striker, you know, so... Um, did you did you swap swap any uh, decent shirts uh, along the way? So I wasn't really big into shirts okay. swapping. You know, I wasn't so. You know, some people made a beeline for other players, but uh, for me, it wasn't wasn't a big thing. You know, I thought. Oh, did you I'm keep many shirts? Game. So did you keep many shirts? Uh, that you, no, I've kept, yeah, well, a couple. Of, I've kept a, a Juventus one. I've kept an Inter Milan one, and uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm a Rangers one, I think I've got, you know. Okay. So, um, yeah, so uh, what about uh, playing for Australia? Did you keep uh, many Aussie shirts? That I kept my last one that I played for, which was against Argentina at, uh, okay. you know, 93. But again, that was a bad, bad experience for me because I fell out with the manager then, Tomo, yeah. and I had a yeah. go at him. And, you know, it was, uh, he dropped me for Paul Wade because. Yeah, Maradona. Uh, Maradona, Maradona came him. and he actually yeah. dropped him. And it was a scenario where I was play, going to be playing. I was playing out the skin. We just uh, qualified for uh, the Premier League. And, uh, you know, I was doing really well. You know, I had Rangers, I had Celtic, I had uh, Southampton. A lot of clubs chased me at the time. Anyway, mm-hmm. that's another story. But it's like, uh, anyway. And then uh, because Maradona, they, we had to beat Argentina at home because I knew we wouldn't beat them there. Yeah. You tell me how many people would bet on Argentina getting beat at home? by Australia going there, you know, it's like even now, you know, it's like you just wouldn't bet, you know, and you just think, well, if you're going there, the best to do is get a draw, you know. Um, And I thought we had to win at home. And if we, to win at home, you had to really go for them. And Mm -hmm. they were, you know, they were shitting themselves, excuse my expression, because Mm -hmm. they just lost 5-0 to Colombia at home. Mm -hmm. Um, And they got knocked out. So playing Colombia in Argentina, losing 5-0, Something had to happen, so they brought Maradona back. And Maradona wasn't fit; he wasn't playing, and he got fit enough to play in our game. But still, it's uh, you know, I, I just felt you had to go for the jugular and, and then win the game at home. And the way I was playing, I think it wasn't really a concentration on people. They didn't really realize, how, in my opinion, they didn't realize how well I was playing, and, yeah. and it sort of left me out, you know. The, and, it's inter- it's interesting. So you were vocal. I mean, obviously you're you're a, you're a very experienced soccer campaigner, but you were you were vocal at the time of being a player. You went on to to be a manager. Um, talk to me about that dichotomy of you know you're a, you're a senior player. You want what's best for the team, but also like every player wants to play. You know, I, I didn't speak to a to a soccer I've spoken to other soccer that think, oh, okay, I got left out of that game. And that, that they're the moments that you think, oh, you know, that's uh, sort of, even if the team wins, but particularly when the team loses, there's almost that vindication of, oh, yeah, if only I could have made a difference, right? So it's the, the what if. I knew I could have made a difference. I mean, it's come in Canada. When we played Canada, he brought me on in Canada. I made a difference yeah. because we were going yeah. out, right? And I came on and made the difference there. And I knew, like, I yeah. was pepped up. And again, it was like, you know, they didn't pay attention to me playing in, in uh, where I was playing because I was playing mm. in the championship. Yeah. Um, you know, playing in Holland or playing in Belgium, you, you know, the championship is probably a higher standard apart from the yeah. top clubs, right? Yeah. So it, uh, yeah. anyway... And it's, yeah, it's that, that Canada game, that Canada game, you copped a nasty gash if from memory. Uh, well, that's right, because they knew I was going to be a threat when I come on on the head. So the guy just went for me straight away, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and what was anyway, it? It was, it was an elbow or was it? Uh, not a headbutt. Mm. Headbutt. Yeah. Okay. So then, you know, that happened straight away. And then I got on with it. And then, uh, 
you know, I held the ball, I held the ball up, laid it back, and then made another run and crossed it over for Mehmet to score. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, but I knew I could have made a difference, and I thought, right, okay, and, and then all the training subsequently after that, you knew you were going to play, and then Maradona's coming, and then he actually you change things, so you you understand you're not going to play. So I had a big row with Tomo then, and I left the team after that. I didn't play for Australia. I walked out in the team, the national team, which is I'm sad mm-hmm. to say, but it's I left my wife back. We just moved, and it's like you know, yeah. Anyway, the um, so Still gets uh, it because what could have been, you know? So yeah, yeah, I get it. So um, and and this goes to show it's a your passion for the country, your passion of wanting yeah, yeah. To, to do oh, yeah, uh... to to do the best for. I mean, you know that. Uh, from memory in that game, he, he didn't really, he, he only did, uh, you know, it was that moment of brilliance, but, you know, that, that side, that, that Batistuta, they had a number of quality players, right? So it was that, I think that one cross that he um, just tore us apart um, goes to show, you know, man past is probably brilliance, but, you know, a moment of brilliance and sport, sets up a goal. Yeah, yeah, no, look, I mean, Argentina, I mean, Traditionally, a powerhouse, right? And but at the time they weren't; they were like on the back foot. So um, the worst thing was we could just keep keep possessing the ball and uh, and don't threaten them enough, you know. So like mm. I think if you went for them, we could have beat them up by a couple of goals, and uh, and then they would have had to they would have had to beat us at home, and you know by a few. And uh, you know I think we were capable of scoring away. But anyway, when we're defending. You know, defending for so long, they're relentless and they're going to win at home against yeah. us. You know? it's, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Only yeah. with the draw, you know, you weren't going to get qualified. So the, the um, so you, you've got this this experience of so you also did a stint, I think, in Malaysia for um, so a number of Aussies also uh, spent uh, time in Malaysia. What was yeah. that experience like? Yeah, no, Malaysia was great. I mean, it was good. I mean, uh, I was there with Mehmet Durakovic and Joe Biscuit. You know, okay, yeah. Visca and uh, yeah, it was great. And we won the Malaysia Cup there. And I was the first Australian or first foreigner they'd actually had from Europe. And they paid a lot of money for A lot of guys were coming from Australia over, playing from the NSL, but they actually paid a lot of money for me to go. And, you know, and, uh, and so it was a big, big news. That, chili. And it was big news for me uh, coming from Malaysia, from a European yeah. country, you know. And after me, Tony Cotty came, you know, it was another one. So, um, but in essence, yeah, Malaysia, 60, 70,000 people used to go and watch it. It's like fantastic. And we won the Malaysia Cup. I scored the goal in that. We won it, 93,000. So it was like massive, you know? And, yeah. Brilliant. And, and it was there. Yeah, it was a good good time, a couple of years. The, the um, you, you were quite, uh, so just going back, you were quite a young lad uh, playing, I think, in the. Really? Um, Merloin Cup when we we did quite well in Singapore. Uh, what was was that a was that a, a quite a good uh, tour with Australia? It was a good experience and and again yeah just going back on how many times from my start of my first game I played for Australia to my last game was in first four World Cup campaigns right so I was the first to do four World Cup campaigns mm. but the scenario was I missed. Again, the games I played for Australia was, I think it was 41 or 42, but A Internationals was 27. Mm. Now, what, what's the difference is that, okay, you pick for the Socceroos, you pick for your national team, pick for the Socceroos, and you're playing against Juventus. So that's not classed as an international. Mm. Mm. Right? So it's not, doesn't come down, doesn't count. Right? So you, when people say, oh, you played 27 games for Australia, you go, well, yeah, but you could have played. <laughs> the total amount was the 27 plus 40, 147 games I missed when I was overseas. Mm. So there's 147 games plus the 27 that I could have been part of, you know? So you look at how many games you could have played for Australia had you not been overseas and you've been here. So it was an amazing amount. Mm. And um, people don't realise that, uh, yeah, that the, the sacrifice you do to come back and play, but when you do it, uh, you like it, but it's not easy. Yeah, the uh, um, so massive sacrifice. It's a lot easier today when the when the boys because they they play in windows of international yeah. breaks where you know clubs get fine, they get transfer bans if they don't let players go. Yeah, it's they all, have it's to all, let them go. Yeah, 
yeah. yeah, it's a lot, a lot more professional. Back in the day, many a, many a um, manager yeah. would say, "Well, you're not going, son." And if you're a young boy, you just say, "Okay, boss," you know, and that's it. Yeah, and that was it. And it was all Central Europe, European, right? So it's everything. You know, they hadn't had international travel before. You know, so um, the, um, the uh, you, you, after you, after your career in, um, in in Europe, in the UK, um, you return to Australia. Um, so what's the body feeling like now? So uh, you said you had some injuries along the way, but, you know, how are you feeling? Yeah, look, I have uh, got an ankle, ankle problem and a bit of a neck problem, but in general, okay, my health is okay. So um, nothing that a lot of players haven't got, you know, um, mm. from playing sport at the highest level. So, but, uh, but I had a groin problem that was persistent that, that nearly ended my career. But that was... Uh, well, that's okay now. So, um, but in general, yeah, you're going to have some knocks and bruises from your career, but nothing too to worry about. The uh, the uh, so in the in the old NSL, the uh, you spent time at uh, I think uh, a little bit of time at uh, uh, Olympic and uh, Sydney, Croatia. So, w- what was that experience like? And then you went on to to, to um, be part uh, coaching those sides too. Is that is that right? Of what? Sorry. What? So, so when you uh, came when to you Olympic were... and then Sydney United, yeah, and then yeah. the other one. So, uh, did you also coach at those sides too? Were you part of the coaching? Uh, yeah, yeah. There? Well, I mean, I won Coach of the Year. I mean, that was the thing when I played Sydney Olympic. I was player coach, and then when I went to Sydney United, I was a bit of player coach, but I mostly coached, and I had Laurie McKinnon as my assistant, mm-hmm. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things we did is from a team that was decimated for a lot of good players that left, uh, Sydney United, because they were the, the champions a couple of years ago, uh, half of them half of them left and, you know, we weren't left with much. Um, and we built the team up and Ange was uh, the champion for South Melbourne at the time and, and we mm. knocked them off and we won the league. So mm. for me, that was a big achievement. And then mm. I won Coach of the Year that year. Um, and yeah, so then the next year... Uh, I moved on to it was Parramatta, yeah, and was mm-hmm. at Parramatta for a few years, and then I went on to Perth after that when the league shut down, everyone finished, and then for uh, for a couple of years, then uh, Perth started, so I went over there and was involved with Perth for four and a half years. Yeah, so that that's uh, so uh, the, what great crowds they had at, at Perth. That would have been a, a great experience being part yeah, of. Yeah, no, look, Perth. I mean. The thing is, everyone remembers Perth from the time they were in the NSL, but when the A-League started, mm. they were the poorer cousins because you had your Sydney FC, you had your Melbourne Victories, and at the time, there was only eight teams that started, and Perth were one of the ones Nick Tanner was pulling out, and he wasn't putting money in. The FFA was banking it up, holding it, and weren't putting all the salary cap in, so the money you got for the players wasn't enough, so you couldn't attract the best. Perth always attracted the best players. But when the A-League started, they were all the players stayed east. They didn't come over. So every year they used to get one or two really top players over from the east. Um, so it was a bit harder for Perth to uh, to get traction. So they never made the finals for a while, you know. Mm. So when I took over, I got them to the finals for the first time. And it was um, – and, and we, but we had to spend a bit of money, I told the owner. You know, you had to spend a bit of money, get some quality in, and then you'll, you'll see things happening, you know. And since then, they've done quite well. Which was good. Yeah. What, what What's one thing that you think that persisted throughout your playing career that you that you stuck uh, true to, that you also then, um, when you manage sides, that you made sure that that was a, a key criteria that all players possessed? Well, a bit of integrity and, and, and ethics, you know. You, you mean, when you have that, and uh, that means they're being on time for training, looking after yourself, you know, not taking the piss, you know, and, uh, and, you know, it's said a lot now, but, you know, you have, you know, you just have good characters within and around the club and they'll, they'll drive the team on themselves within themselves, you know, so it's having the characters and one guy that I could always say from the Perth point of view that was good that way was, uh, um, you know, was Jamie Harmel, you know, Jamie was good. He used to help drive and he, he cared for the club and he wanted the club to win. He was from Perth. Mm. Another one was Ante Kovacevic, you know, he was a good guy, you know, and um, mm. Ante's well-known around the football 
um, administration now, but he was a great player and a good lad in the dressing room, you know. So, uh, yeah, so you need characters as players and, and, and that's what you, you know, you look for. A um, bit of leadership in them, coming from them and, and you've got to be careful not to give them too much control because mm. then all the players think, oh, yeah, this is good. With them. They can have a bit of a jolly, you know. Um, mm. But there's a time when, you know, you've got to stand firm and, um, and yeah, that just that integrity and, um, and self-belief that you want to, you all want to be in the same way and pull in the same way and you all want to win and you're not just there for a jolly, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you would have seen uh, many young boy um, come through the ranks. So talk to me, you're speaking now to that 16, 17, 18, 19 year old boy or girl. And they want to, and they want to take that next level. They want to transition into first team football. What advice do you have for them? Well, look, I mean, sometimes you have a bit of bad luck when you, you, you know, um, good players don't get the opportunity and, and you hear a lot of bad luck stories, but sometimes it's true. But look, work on your technique, work on your fitness, because at the end of the day, you have to have, to play at the elite level, if you want to make it elite level, you have to be pretty fit and you have to be quick and you have to have a good touch. Um, you know, if you've got those, they're all the basics you must have because touch buys you time. And if you have a good touch, you can look up and then you can look to pass and then you can actually move. And if you're pretty fit, you can get around the, the, the park. And, um, you know, and if you're quick, then obviously that's another asset that you have. So, you know, and there's, there's different sort of quicknesses. And when I say quick, yeah, there's a sprint quick, but then there's also one where, Sash, you might be quicker than me, but if I can read the situation and get my body in front of yours, then I'm quicker there. And if I get my body in front of yours and I can get the ball, then you won't be able to get it. So it's quickness of thought. There's another mm-hmm. aspect, which is, it's hard to teach. And that's that sort of ingrained in people where they can just see the thing happening. And I'll take a picture. You'll see things different than I would. And, you know, and that's someone having a, another level of picture that they see that they can actually know what's going to happen or they think what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's trying to, you know, develop that sense, you know, your touch, your, your, your fitness, uh, very important, you know, and then play as much as you can. Play as, as, as you know, I don't think we get enough game time here, you know. Mm. Fantastic words of wisdom, David Mitchell. You've been a pioneer for many, many, many other young Australians to go on uh, and play in Europe, and they would have looked at you. You also helped... Uh, um, so Jason Van Blurk uh, said to me in his interview that he you were instrumental in making uh, his way easier into um, into the UK. So thank you not only for being a great representative um, for Australia, but also helping other Aussies make their way um, to play professional football. Yeah, sure, mate. Look, I, I worked as a scout to final here after I played football and after I managed that. So I've helped Brett Holman, Brett Emerton go over there as well. So it's a like- it's good for them. They had great careers and they were good players. So um, if you're good enough, you've got to stick with it, right? It's, uh, you've got to have that self-belief. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. All right, Sash, no problems. See you, pal. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. We've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button? and have a fantastic day.